Yes. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got a great panel of speakers this morning for you. We mostly want to take your questions. Um, we have four speakers in the room here. I'll just briefly identify them. And please hold your applause until <laughs> David Doniger, he's the director of our Climate and Clean Air Program. David Goldstein, Director of Government Affairs. Pete Altman, Director of Climate and Clean Air Campaign. And Heather Taylor, who's the Director of the NRDC Action Fund. And I'll have a, more of a word about that in a minute. We have uh, one other speaker, a fifth speaker on the phone, who will be joining us, uh, Kim Knowlton. She's a senior scientist in the NRDC. And she was a co-author of the National Climate Assessment, a chapter of the assessment that you all remember covering a few weeks ago. And we I'm also, here, Ed. I'm with you. Welcome, Kim. Nice to have you. Thank you very much. She's in uh, New York, and she'll uh, speak in a few minutes. Uh, we have a bunch of NRDC experts around the room. They graciously made themselves available to answer your questions, um, and they all were very key players in the development of the NRDC carbon pollution reduction approach that has gained some traction and also in the run-up to, to Monday's announcement, uh, such as Derek Murrow in the back, who can speak eloquently about energy efficiency and its contributions to carbon reduction, uh, Jake Schmidt in the back corner to talk about the international implications of what we're trying to do, uh, Wesley Warren in the back, who's the director of the uh, Center for Policy Advocacy, uh, and, and many others. And, and so... Uh, and there are still other experts on the phone who might be asked to chime in on uh, individual questions, including Henry Henderson from our Chicago office to talk about Midwest issues. And if there's anything we can't provide on the fly here, we will be happy to get back with you uh, as soon as uh, necessary. And just so you all know, we're ha having this on-the-record briefing uh, transcribed, and, it's by, and we hope to provide audio and the text of the transcript on our website by tomorrow sometime for those of you who do not need to write immediately and, and want to go back and check on quotes. That will be available. And because it's being recorded, I ask each reporter to please identify yourself, especially at the start, and your affiliation. That would be great. And naturally, I have to add, NRDC stands for the Natural Resources <laughs> Defense Council. <laughs> Let there be no mistake today, please. And the final note is Heather Taylor is the director of the NRDC Action Fund, which is an affiliate but a separate organization from NRDC. Uh, and unlike NRDC, the NRDC Action Fund, as a 501c4, um, is allowed to engage in certain advocacy and political activities that NRDC cannot do. So when she speaks, she is speaking as the NRDC Action Fund director whereas the others are speaking on behalf of NRDC, the C3, unless otherwise specified. So uh, David's going to, Donovan's going to make some opening remarks about the, the plan, and David Goldstein will talk a little bit about what's ahead and the implications for the government and for, for the activities that we're going to see in the coming months and years. And Pete Altman's going to talk a little bit about like, how we're going to uh, really step up the advocacy to make this problem rule happen and stick. And Heather Taylor will, is going to talk about how this policy is also good politics and why running clean is a smart thing to do. So, David Doniger, please take it away. Thanks, Ed. I'm David Doniger. After decades of warnings, we can see that climate change is happening here and now, doing serious damage in every part of the country. These climate impacts are being driven by heat trapping carbon pollution, and the number one source of that pollution is the fleet of 1,600 fossil fuel burning electric power plants, which together emit more than 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year, 40% of the nation's total CO2. We must limit that pollution. We limit every other kind of power plant pollution, soot, smog, mercury, it's time to close the loophole for carbon pollution. The President and his EPA already have the legal authority to act using a law already on the books, the Clean Air Act. Far from going around <coughs> Congress, President Obama is carrying out his duty to faithfully execute a law Congress 
have already enacted. First enacted in 1970, the Clean Air Act gives EPA the responsibility for any air pollutant found to endanger public health or welfare, including by changing the climate. The Supreme Court has already twice upheld this authority in Massachusetts versus EPA in 2007 and in American Electric Power versus Connecticut in 2011. That case specifically concerned power plants. In his first term, the president set strong carbon pollution and fuel economy standards for cars and trucks. Now is the time to tackle the biggest source. The power plant standard will be issued under Section 111D of the Clean Air Act. The process works as follows. EPA sets a standard, and then states carry out that standard through state implementation plans. EPA sets the benchmark, but the first shot at implementation is with the states. If the state declines to submit an adequate plan, then it's EPA's responsibility to implement a federal one. We expect EPA next week to propose a fair and flexible standard one that recognizes that each state starts with a different power generation mix and one that allows states and the power companies a wide range of flexible cost-effective compliance options. Using the same modeling platform that EPA and the industry use, the Darth Vader is on the phone. <laughs> Using the same modeling platform that EPA and industry use, the ICF integrated planning model, NRDC has shown that with a fair and flexible approach, we can achieve very significant carbon reductions at modest cost and with huge public health and environment and, and climate benefits worth many times that cost. For example, in our moderate full efficiency case, and you can see that in the paper that you have, we show that we can cut carbon pollution 35% below 2005 levels by 2020. That's a reduction of 860 million tons of CO2. These carbon reductions also bring about dramatic further reductions in other power plant pollutants that cause soot and smog, and the reductions in all these pollutants get larger after 2020. Just in 2020, uh, we assess that the standard, this standard would prevent more than 1,000 premature deaths, more than 15,000 asthma deaths, more than 1,000 emergency room deaths. It will all cost less than for the mercury and air toxic standards being implemented now. Using our approach can stimulate investments of $86 billion in job creating energy efficiency and renewable energy between now and 2020. Energy efficiency improvements will drive consumers' electric bills down, not up. Let me say that again. Electric bills will drop, not rise. So putting a dollar value on the lives saved, the reduced illnesses, the climate change damages, the benefits in 2020 surpass the cost by 30 to $50 billion. That's just for one year. The key to achieving these results is mobilizing all the measures that cut carbon pollution across the electric power system, not just relatively small reductions from making coal-fired plants a bit more efficient, but also the much bigger reductions that come from shifting power generation from dirty, the dirtiest existing plants towards bigger ones, from generating more power from renewables and other non-emitting sources, and from making our heating and cooling systems, lights, appliances, and other machines, do their work more efficiently. EPA has conducted a huge listening and consulting effort, and we've seen lots of state officials and company executives expressing support for this kind of fair and flexible approach. The process that starts next week will extend over several years. Over the next year, EPA will respond to public comments, and we're confident that millions more Americans will raise their voices in support of strong standards. And then issue final, EPA will then issue final standards in June 2015. States will have another year to craft and submit their implementation plans. And power companies will then have several years, probably until 2020, to come into compliance. Now is the time to act. It's our moral obligation to our children. It's America's duty to carry its own weight and lead other countries in joint global action. And it will be the President's legacy in ours, too. Thank you. So I, <coughs> excuse me, I'm David Goldston. Um, we never have only one David at an RDC event. Um, I'm the Director of Government Affairs. I just wanted to say, uh, 
word or two on how we see the overall political context of this, and then Pete and Heather will fill in um, a lot of the details that we have planned. Um, so I'd say this is we see this as the pivotal battle on climate change for U.S. domestic politics. I mean, really, for the first time, climate is going to be front and center as the national issue. Um, and what that means, we think, is that when this battle is over and the uh, power plant standards are in effect, climate will be turned, have turned into an ordinary environmental issue, not something where people claim that we can't go near this or it's too hard to lift or any of those things that um, people, we think, incorrectly say now. So this is really the, the turning point battle for ethical change. There will be, this will be contested in Congress, where there will certainly be efforts, there already have been some, to uh, block these standards going forward. It will be contested in the states. Again, that's already happening um, with groups like ALEC trying to make it hard for states to uh, carry out uh, uh, implementation of the standards, and it will no doubt happen in the courts. Um, we are prepared for all those battles. Um, it will be an extended period because of the nature of the Clean Air Act and the different stages that David just referenced in these going forward, with first the standards becoming final nationally, then the state plans and the, the court challenges. Um, but we think when this will be it, when this is over and with an election, at least one election in the midst of that, uh, that Heather will talk about, obviously this November, that again, this issue will have been front and center, fully debated for the first time. Uh, it will be clear that the public supports and that the uh, political system supports moving forward with these standards. The standards will then be demystified. It will be once again shown that um, going forward on environmental issues does not uh, hurt the economy or uh, create other problems, and we will be able to move forward in a very different way than the way climate politics looks now. So that's why we think these are important, A, because they actually will be effective. Um, as David noted, they'll cause real cuts in carbon from the largest single core uh, source, but also because they will, in the end, fundamentally change the political dynamic on climate change. So with that, why don't I turn to Kim. Thank you, Dave. Uh, oh, let's Kim. turn to Kim Knowlton on the phone from New York. She's our senior scientist who helped write the National Climate Assessment. Kim. Great. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I, I want to offer my perspective as a health scientist on what the proposals are going to mean, because limiting climate change is about protecting public health and the well-being of communities today and in the future. As a health scientist, I think that climate change becomes really, really personal when we look at the public health impacts. We used to think that climate change was happening to other people, but now it's happening to us. We see this highlighted in the recent Third National Climate Assessment Report, which Ed mentioned is the most comprehensive look to date on how climate change is affecting Americans' health today already in our backyard. We're seeing more frequent extreme weather events including heavy downpours, extreme heat, and those are fueled by climate change. For example, climate change is fueling more frequent heat waves that are lasting longer. They're covering wider areas. Remember in Texas in 2011, many locations saw 100 days over 100 degrees, and that heat intensifies drought and wildfire risks. And that heat is not just an inconvenience, it can be lethal. Heat waves have sent thousands of people to emergency rooms. One California heat wave in 2006 sent over 16,000 people to emergency rooms. And we've got millions of Americans who are especially vulnerable to heat. Older people, children, people with heart and lung illnesses. So those people who are already struggling to stay healthy are going to see problems amplified with climate change. Another example, there's 26 million Americans with asthma. We probably all know someone with asthma. But the rising temperatures that are being fueled by climate change worsen air pollution like ozone smog. Then you have allergens like pollen, which along with air pollution can trigger asthma attacks. Climate change, unfortunately, is also affecting the plants that produce pollen. We've already seen a lengthening in ragweed pollen seasons in the central U.S. and Canada. 
two to three weeks longer between 1995 and 2011. The American Thoracic Society, the professional association of lung doctors and respiratory specialists, they found that climate change is especially dangerous for kids and seniors because their lungs are more vulnerable. All of this is costing us, not just in terms of human illness and suffering, climate change costs in dollars too. A study that we published in the journal Health Affairs looked at six extreme events that struck the U.S. already between 2000 and 2009, and these are types of events that are going to worsen as climate change continues. Ozone smog, heat waves, coastal storms, infectious disease outbreaks, river floods, wildfires. We found that the health-related costs from those six events exceeded $14 billion. And we know now more clearly than ever that none of us, no one among us, is going to be untouched by climate change's effects. So speaking today as an NRDC health scientist, I'm really concerned because climate-related hazards are going to increase if we don't take action to reduce carbon pollution, which causes climate change. Now, earlier this month, 80 scientists and health professionals signed a letter sent to congressional leaders urging them to significantly cut carbon pollution and support climate preparedness efforts. So the important thing is we have this huge opportunity now to protect the health of the people and places we care about, and that's what the proposed standard is really about. We get a double benefit. We improve air quality today. We get a huge benefit in limiting heat, trapping carbon pollution that causes climate change for the future. We've been collecting the dots for years on the links between climate change and health, but now we're connecting those dots. And we're really standing at this fork in the road. The decisions that we make today are going to affect our children and grandchildren. Children, They're going to have to live with the consequences. So we really can't afford not to take this huge opportunity to benefit public health and take a huge step forward and create cleaner, more secure communities by supporting these limits on heat trap and carbon pollution. So with that, I'll say thanks again for uh, letting me join the conversation today. I really look forward to uh, questions and dialogue. Great. Thanks, Tim. My name is Pete Altman. I'm the Climate and Clean Air Campaign Director for NRDC. And we absolutely see this fight over the carbon standards as essentially the Super Bowl of climate politics right now. And it's a fight to determine whether we're going to protect our health and future generations or whether we're going to end up siding with polluters and their profits. We think that just as we have federal limits on how much arsenic, lead, and mercury power plants can dump into the air, we need to have limits on how much carbon pollution they can dump into the air. So on one side, we've got the White House, whose efforts to put forward these standards are supported by hundreds of elected officials and a broad and diverse array of advocacy organizations that include environmental groups, but also include health organizations, Latino groups, African American groups, business organizations, faith groups, labor unions, all working to get uh, to take responsibility for climate change and to reduce carbon pollution. Now, pushing back, of course, are polluters and their allies, led as usual, by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers and the coal interests, who are clinging desperately to an outdated, dirty energy source that the market has already been walking away from. And that is uh, poses such a wide range of risks. In the last couple of months, we've just seen the North Carolina coal ash spill, seen the uh, contamination of uh, river in West Virginia from uh, coal chemical spill. And the threat to our climate uh, is this, uh, is right large, the danger that, that coal poses. The standards protect our health also worry the Koch brothers, who fund an intricate web of advocacy groups like Americans for Prosperity uh, that <clears throat> are going to fight back and try to prevent the standards for, from uh, uh, being implemented, and who also support Tea Party politicians like Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul. Um, but we have the facts on our side, and we have the public on our side. Most Americans support limiting carbon pollution from power plants. We know that from poll after poll, which Heather will get into, um, key demographic groups, women, young people, Latinos, independents, 
support the President's plan and support cleaning up power plants. And it isn't just from Poland that we know that there's this support. Over 3.2 million comments have been submitted to the Environmental Protection Agency urging the EPA to set limits on carbon pollution from power plants. Thousands and thousands of people have turned out to town hall meetings, rallies, roundtables, EPA hearings <laughs> in all 50 states to support limiting carbon pollution. You can see pictures, descriptions, media coverage of those events at IWillAct.us. So you don't have to take my word for it, and I don't have any, don't have time to show pictures. But um, going forward, we're going to redouble our efforts and work in a coordinated way with other environmental groups and other allies. We actually started this March with a $5 million television buy combined with a digital campaign and organizing in 11 states. That resulted in over 80 meetings with senators uh, and nearly 30 roundtables. And then we're going to go much bigger in June with what we call Climate Summer, which will feature um, multi-platform push with national TV ads, a digital campaign, social media, uh, ramping up advocacy effort from environmental groups and other advocacy groups like health and business and some of the others that I named. We will have over 300 events over the course of the summer in 36 states that include elected officials, businesses, people of faith, people of color, coming together to say we need to tackle this problem and we need these limits on carbon pollution. So beyond our own immediate effort, uh, there are hundreds of public elected officials, senators, governors, local electeds, who have made clear their commitment to reducing carbon pollution and are supporting the EPA plan. Hundreds of public health organizations, as Kim mentioned. Uh, a record number of Latino groups, led by Voces Verdes, urging that we move, put these standards into place. The Hip Hop Caucus, <coughs> which is a voice for young African Americans, recently did a multi-state tour advocating for the carbon standards. You probably noticed the Pope recently offered up his views on the importance of tackling climate change, and that is being echoed by uh, faith meetings and um, uh, prayer vigils by faith groups throughout the US. And NRDC and other groups work closely with labor unions many of whom also support carbon standards. But the most important thought to leave you with is that in, even in the business community, there are a lot of companies that support moving ahead with carbon standards. The US Chamber does not speak for the United States business community. And four years ago, we saw this plainly during the carbon legislation fights when a number of their members defected because the Chamber was so determined to block carbon legislation. Um, and they were clearly carrying the water of just a few of uh, uh, special interests who are members of the chamber. So now they're at it again. But as Bloomberg recently reported, the utility industry is split. There are several utilities that are looking forward to standards or are going to have decided not to oppose them, but will work with the EPA on them. There's half a dozen other business groups that represent small businesses, and clean businesses, and chambers of commerce that are actively supporting the standards and communicating to their members and communicating to the public that they see opportunity in moving ahead. So when you go to the chamber event, just remember they are not speaking for all businesses. Um, why don't I stop there? I'm Heather Taylor Measley. I'm the director of the NRDC Action Fund. Um, as Ed said, we um, engage both in advocacy and electoral politics. Um, but do spend most of our time on advocacy, and so I'm, I'm happy to be with you today. When it comes to climate change, good policy is good politics. Voters literally see the world transforming around them as children have more asthma attacks, as our weather grows more extreme, and as other countries lead to develop energy sources of tomorrow while the U.S. clings to old, dirty fossil fuels. Conventional wisdom says that candidates who support climate action will lose at the ballot box. But I'm here to tell you that the facts don't support that conventional wisdom. According to poll after poll and election outcome after election outcome, voters want action. They trust EPA more than they trust Congress. And candidates who lead on this issue are more likely to win than lose. Despite their best efforts and extremely deep pockets, Fossil fuel backers lose much more often than they win. 
In 2012, the Koch brothers and their fellow polluters targeted candidates who championed the environment with more than $270 million in TV ads in the last two months of the campaign. But the environmental champions prevailed. In fact, the Koch brothers had a 5% win rate last cycle. The environmental community had almost a 100% win rate. For an industry fo highly focused on its return on investment, they don't have much to show their investors when it comes to electoral politics of climate change. This goes to show that big money is not always the smarter money. Candidates this fall, prospects in 2016, and climate deniers like Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, who may eventually have to appeal to a broader electorate, would do well to pay attention. Voters want climate action. The fact is, voters want polluters to reduce their carbon pollution. Senate candidates running in 2014 should take notice. In March, we asked Harstead Strategic Research to run a poll in the closest Senate races in the country. This was 11 different races. We asked them to ask the hard questions. We told them to phrase it how they would any candidate, how our opposition would phrase it. And Harstead really went to town. We were a little nervous, I'm not going to lie, whenever they, uh, they showed us the questions they were asking in these 11 closest races in the country. Um, but we trusted them. Harstead specializes in, Amer in America's heartland. They represent candidates like Tester, McCaskill, Mark Udall, uh, Walsh. And they asked everything that, uh, that would challenge any kind of conventional wisdom. And what we found was that the results were actually quite spectacular, even in places like Louisiana, places like Georgia, places like Arkansas. According to the polling from Harstead Strategic Research, more than two-thirds of voters in the 11 closest battleground states say EPA should limit carbon pollution from power plants. This includes 53% of Republicans, 63% of independents, and 87% of Democrats. Also, in what has been dubbed the Year of the Woman, candidates can add another list of things that women care about, supporting limits on carbon pollution. Women understand by a margin of 72% to 19% that we have a moral obligation to future generations to make the air safer to breathe and the climate more stable. This begins with holding power plants accountable for the carbon they pump into the skies. This is not news to us. Long-term trends confirm this polling. On election night 2012, Greenberg Quinlan Rosner Research polled and showed that of the six reasons to vote against the president, issues like health care, taxes, the economy, the deficit, the Republican message on energy fell completely flat, down to the list, and it was fifth as far as being cited by just 14% of voters who said it was a reason to vote against the president. The message ranked last among people who voted for Romney. It also ranked last of those people who were voting in the Midwest where Republicans heavily focused on attacking candidates because of their stances on fossil fuels. As we look towards November, the fossil fuel industry and their allies are going to spend a lot of money on the airwaves, and they will use their made-up accusations and their misinformation about carbon standards. But we know, because voters see the world changing around them, that we, they will stand with candidates who are running clean. And I think we're ready for questions, right, Ed? Do you have that? Can you send us? Is that research here? Uh, it is. The poll is um, is right here. You'll also see what was interesting is even in the four red states that we polled, um, you know, places that were straight up red, even the Republicans, the majority of Republicans supported action there. And again, this, these are questions that we didn't, it wasn't like we tried to, to alter the results by the way the questions were worded. They had carte blanche in how they um, asked these questions of these different voters in these 11 close races. And so we think that this is some of the most convincing um, convincing research that we've got out there. Neela? Okay. Neela you with the Los Angeles Times. Um, I, I wanted to uh, go into the political issue a little bit. Um, this, this administration has shown an uncanny ability on um, very important issues of getting its messaging wrong and being two steps behind the opposition. So it's one thing for um, for environmental groups to say they're going to make a fourth of the country. Uh, what kind of what are you hearing from the White House about how about their messaging? And what do you think we need to do to get this right and get uh, get ahead of what will be the criticisms that, that are going to come out of the So let me start real quickly and then. 
that's been meeting with them a lot. So let's start with what you're hearing from the White So, um, so what we're hearing is they're working on this constantly. I think this is very different. They brought in Podesta specifically <laughs> to work on this. They understand uh, that that this is going to be. The president has said now this is one of the uh, two big issues of the second term. They've been planning nonstop on it. They've been thinking about it politically as well as substantively. So I think this is very different. Won't bother agreeing or disagreeing with their premise, but the uh, but there's no question that they've learned both from past battles and they've put together the team to do this. And they've been uh, meeting with everybody who is interested, whether that's business groups, environmental groups, and so forth. So I think it's very different from uh, earlier battles that way. Yeah, I'd like to add, um, from a messaging perspective, we think they're absolutely spot on. That they, they understand what matters about this issue, and the President's been extremely effective beginning with the State of the Union speech two speeches ago with talking about climate in a clear and compelling manner. They understand that the health impacts matter. They understand what Kim talked about, that people are beginning to see it as more of a personal issue, and that that's, that's where they've been focused. Um, and we've also seen a significant escalation in the White House using the power of the administration um, to where the president has taken a much more proactive role. He sat down with meteorologists uh, a couple of weeks ago when the, the White House released the National Climate Assessment in order, because we think that we see a personal stake in, uh, on the president's part in advancing this issue forward. Uh, but they've also been deploying cabinet members. So, in fact, one of our uh, ally groups organized an event in Iowa uh, where uh, Secretary Vilsack uh, attended and spoke um, and uh, brought a lot of people together. We've had cabinet officials participate in other events uh, in other states. Um, Gina McCarthy has been on the road uh, meeting with both state officials as well as doing public events. So we think they're doing, um, following all the right steps on this issue um, and talking about it exactly the right way. Chris? Um, funny that. Chris Joyce with National Public Radio. Um, this is likely to be litigated. I suppose you expect it to be litigated. And in the context of what happened in the Supreme Court, where do you see Chamber of Commerce at all attacking the Clean Air Act? Where's the weakness? Where's the potential weakness in the Clean Air Act? What do you expect? And what is your plan? I'm sure you're talking about it already, about how you defend it when an RBC files for the court. Well, EPA is running a pretty good string right now of victories in the courts, in the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. And the position that they are if they, if they take a position like the one we're recommending, they'll be on very strong ground. The latest Supreme Court decision is very clear that the agency has leeway to deal with problems as they evolve using the law that was written as long as 44 years ago. Um, and they get, they're supposed to get a substantial amount of deference from the courts. If they do their job well, they explain what they're doing well, and they have a, a solid record of technical information back up where they are. So we're feeling very confident. All of the carbon cases so far have gone in EPA's in our favor. Um, if you count Massachusetts, that was in our favor, not the old EPA's, but in the new EPA's favor. Um, there's one case pending that will come down sometime between now and the end of June in the Supreme Court. I just want to emphasize that no matter how that case comes out, it will not affect what EPA is about to propose on standards because it's about secondary permit provisions of the act. And we, we, uh, we think EPA has a good chance of winning that case, but even if they lose, the power that the uh, EPA has to set the standards we've been talking about under the Clean Air Act is very secure. The Supreme Court has already upheld it twice and signified in the reasoning and in the argument case I'm talking about, that they're not going back on any of that. So lawsuits are part of the normal business. Uh, the track record of the chamber, the red state uh, governors and so on, in attacking these carbon standards is abysmal. They have lost everything so far. 
and um, we're quite confident that EPA, with, uh, with the support from groups like ours, will do very well in the courts. Chuck? Um, this is for Heather. Um, pretending to your poll, are, are red state and purple state Democratic senators who occasionally vote Republicans on this issue, are they out of touch with their constituents? Is that essentially, can we draw that from, from your polling? And secondly, <coughs> how important in this effort of battle to move forward is it that the Democrats hold the Senate after this fall? Those are really good questions. Uh, first, I would say, yes, I do think that they're out of touch. I do think that the polling, um, just as kind of like your traditional uh, political hack here, I do think the polling's changed and become much stronger in the last few years. And I'm wondering if, you know, these guys only have to run every six years, right? And so I'm wondering if they've really tested the issue as well as they should be testing the issue. Um, you'll have to ask them about what their, their motives are. But I do think that this poll clearly says, I mean, Harstad is not an environmental pollster. Let's just be clear. They are a candidate pollster. And so I think that this poll really, you know, truly demonstrates that they need to go back and ask the hard questions. I think the reason we've seen the switch, though, is because people are seeing this around them. Their children are more likely not to be able to, to breathe well. They're not allowed to go outside during red days. What's, I mean, you know, I'm, I uh, was raised in Kentucky. A red day? Like, what's that? You know, that's, a, that's not, that's not a, something that, that they had to deal with when they were children. And so I do think that they need to go back and uh, they need to ask the hard questions. I, and I, for the record, I believe that to be the case with Republicans, too. The NRDC Action Fund is a nonpartisan group. We actually are supporting Republicans and Democrats this cycle uh, very proudly. And so we believe that an environmental majority is going to have to take people from, from both sides of the aisle. And that's what we're working towards. Um, I don't think that there's any question, though, that Harry Reid's going to be better on our issues than Mitch McConnell if he prevails against Allison Lundgren Grimes. And so for right now, I think that uh, I think that it's more important for us to have Harry Reid there. Um, and so holding the Senate, while not our main uh, objective, is something that, of course, we have to be concerned about because leadership is the one who sets the agenda on the floor. Just one quick thing on the um, political out of stuff. I mean, we see Democrats in these investment states being more vocal on climate change. Kay Hagan being a clear example where she gave a very forceful floor speech, went out of her way to do that on, on climate. So um, I think you know, we can see that elected officials are voting with their feet on this and with their vocal cords and um, bearing out the notion that they feel this is where their constituents are going to be. The other thing I just want to, a couple of other names that David just reminded me of. Um, so you saw Marco Rubio come out and start to question it. And by Tuesday, he's at the National Press Club trying to, to nuance his words, right? You know, so I even think Republicans are starting to realize this. You see Rick Scott on the front page of the Miami Herald, actually, maybe not the front, but on the, in the Miami Herald today um, saying that he doesn't know if climate change is real because he's not a scientist whereas before he was a denier. So I do think that even Republicans at this point are starting to go, oh, maybe I need to, to reconsider this. Because you see people, Gary Peters up in Michigan, who's running for um, Senate up there to fill Levin's seat. Here's a guy who's using climate denial to his advantage. He's basically using it to show that Terry Lynn Land, the Republican candidate running against him, is out of step and maybe not smart enough to represent the, the state of Michigan in the Senate because she doesn't actually trust the science that's out there. And so we see all these candidates, one after another, going, maybe I'm on the wrong side of this. And they're starting to walk back their words. And I think that's really important. I think that's going to be something you see all over the place in the next couple of months. And uh, I, for one, am looking forward to it. I want to add something about, about Rick Scott, just because I think um, considerable attention was drawn to the fact that Florida is ground zero for climate change. So uh, they are... They are really experiencing the impacts already on a day-to-day -day basis, and they know the danger they're in. Um, Rick Scott uh, may have noticed that um, uh, the president of the Evangelical Environmental Network was on TV twice last week, CNN and then MSNBC, saying, we need Rick Scott to pay attention to this issue because um, God calls us to be caretakers of creation, and people are really at risk from this. And so I just thought that was an interesting example because that's where the faith voices come out really loud and clear in Florida on this issue. The other is uh, John Walsh in Montana did an event uh, a few weeks ago with 
uh, <clears throat> a public event with uh, a bunch of people talking about the need to tackle climate change. And John Tester, during his last <coughs> election, ran standing up for the environment and, and clean air and clean energy and won. Um, so we are seeing a shift, in fact, where elected officials are beginning to understand that they can be in a better place by being on the right side of this issue. Not all of them, but we're, we're moving ahead. Uh, yeah, Josh Sutter with AP. Uh, to build on my colleague's question, it seems like uh, once this inevitably enters a litigation phase, the likeliest point of tension or a likely point of tension will be over some of the murkier sections of the Clean Air Act, and specifically whether um, whether 111D can be used to um, to apply methods that are so-called outside the fence. Um, assuming that the administration does go in the direction of the, the plan that NRDC has developed, um, uh, what legal basis do you see for 111D to be used to regulate outside the fence? Well, first of all, let's be clear that the sources which would be regulated are the carbon dioxide emitting power plants. The question really is, what are the tools they have to comply with? Is it only uh, hardware that they can install on their own facility? Or can they take advantage of credits and averaging with, with facilities uh, and, the, and the energy efficiency at the end use in our buildings? The, the, can, can we create a system in which there are compliance <coughs> instruments, credits, that they can use to supplement their compliance in addition to the things that do to directly pick up the facility? We crossed that river a long time ago with the acid rain program. <coughs> We crossed that river a long time ago with credit uh, programs all over the Clean Air Act. And the language in Section 111B is um, uh, of the same kind. It even refers to the language in another section, Section 110, which authorizes these marketable trading and, uh, 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 and averaging and crediting. So um, we think that this can be done in, in, in a very sound legal matter is um, it's not new. And just one quick thing that also gets back to Neela's question, which is the White House has been you know, acutely aware of this question as they've been preparing. So, I mean, this has been part of the idea they've gotten. The state has said, I think, uh, emboldened uh, correctly by the recent Supreme Court decisions, but this is not something that's going to catch anyone off guard. This is part of the overall planning for the, for the uh, standards to be Question down here. Uh, William Morrison from Social Media News. Um, my question, I have two questions actually, but one, I was wondering if you could <laughs> give us a clear idea of how many utility companies are going to be affected by this. And of those companies, how many, and you spoke to this a little bit earlier, um, support action, and how many do not, in other words, these guys are going to be the block that you're up against. Uh, so could you sort of define that in more precise terms for us? Well, actually, a little bit later today, NRDC and other organizations uh, are putting out a report, a uh, benchmarking report, um, and, it's, and um, it tabulates the emissions of all these 1,600 power plants by the company that owns them, for the top 100 companies. And you can see an enormous diversity in the carbon intensity of the amount of emissions that different companies have. Some of them have a very heavy carbon emissions profile, and others of them have uh, a much lighter profile. And if you, if you examine the, the names, you'll find, and in some recent press reports, that some of the ones with, which are in a better position uh, are actually speaking out in favor of an approach like this. Now, all of them are holding their fire until they see what the proposal is. Even American Electric Power, uh, which is uh, one of the carbon heavy uh, uh, carbon intense uh, companies has spoken out in saying that they prefer flexible approaches to inflexible ones. They okay, prefer these, these, uh, these what come to be called these outside defense line mechanisms to uh, an approach that doesn't happen. So we'll have to see where they, where they, where they are. And, and uh, um, uh, the, the other thing I would note is that this report shows that even the ones with the heaviest carbon profile have been making improvements since uh, 2005, 2008, which is the, the peak years of carbon emissions for the country and for the power system. That uh, corresponds to the, the lower price and 
and uh, availability of natural gas, but also uh, the lower price and availability of wind, of solar, of energy efficiency. All of those alternates have been gaining, coal has been losing, and the carbon profile of these companies has been coming down, <coughs> so that um, some of them are a third or even a halfway towards meeting the standard that we propose for 2020 uh, already, just as a result of market forces and the, and the other EPA standards. So the president's uh, climate action plan last year included a schedule, which they are, which if the thing comes out next week, they will be spot on meeting, actually it'll be day late, because he asked for the standards to come out on Sunday. Um, but but the, the rest of the schedule is calibrated so that the final standard would be done a year from now. There would be 13 months for states to submit plans. There would be a period of time in 2016 for the EPA to approve and disapprove those plans. And I hope it isn't necessary, but to start this federal plan process in, in, in the case of any state that uh, doesn't submit a plan. Uh, so we think that the, the, the solid base of all the steps can be done within the, the, this term, will be done within this term. Many of the states, including states you wouldn't necessarily think of it, based on their sort of um, uh, color profile, uh, are um, looking very closely at this. A, because the utilities in those states want the state to take the lead. They don't want to have a, a federal plan uh, come down over which they might not have so much control. And uh, uh, B, because there's a lot of opportunity, as, as my colleagues have been uh, citing. You know, there's a big battle going on in Ohio um, over energy efficiency standards and renewable standards. Uh, the question is whether to repeal some of the requirements. And the energy efficiency and renewables businesses, which have got their roots in the ground in the last few years because of the, those programs, are opposing the uh, supposed business-friendly efforts to roll back these, uh, these uh, measures. So, uh, and even, I would also point you to even the state of Texas, uh, when we filed comments uh, earlier this year, or late last year, on EPA's plans, the first four pages or so, of the 12 or 15 pages, say, go away, we don't want to hear from you, get lost. And the last uh, uh, 10 or 12 pages say, but if you're going to do this, please give us credit for all the changes from coal to gas, from coal to wind, uh, from any, for energy efficiency that have gone on in the last decade here in the great state of Texas. I just want to add a, a little bit to that. In terms of what do we have to do, um, the EPA has been doing an extraordinary, an extraordinary amount of outreach to uh, the regulators who will be the ones who've got to write up the specifics about how their state will meet the carbon standard. Um, they have met with uh, the utility commissions and the environmental agencies for all of the states, um, and we think that most of the states have begun grappling with, okay, how are we going to uh, figure out our own plan for meeting the standard? They've got a year to think about it, uh, and then uh, next year when the final standards emerge, they'll have a year to actually put together plans and get them into the EPA, which will, so those are due June 30th, 2016. Uh, and then the EPA has got several months to um, approve uh, the plan that states have submitted. So it is a tight time frame, but there's been an enormous amount of legwork already done. Um, and NRC has certainly been very busy on that front as well, working with states. Um, so we think it'll move along. So and let me, can I, if, if, this is just really quick, I just also want to make clear, I don't believe a person can win the White House in 2016 that is a climate denier. I, I just don't think the polling yields any kind of result that way. And so I do believe that by the end of 20, um, 2016, we'll, we'll have a lot of these standards in place, but it's not like we believe that the work ends the day the president, the president leaves, the, leaves office. We believe that the next president who will be elected will be somebody who will champion this issue, champion this issue because we believe that the, 
the voters are going to be calling for that on a very regular basis. I think they're going to see that in 2016, and I believe that the polling is just going to get stronger in the next couple of years. So two really quick things. One, the White House is acutely aware of the timing, right? They've worked that out. So I, I think, you know, court cases may be going on, but they, this has been time so that everything is in effect. The second thing for people who don't cover this much is that this state-by-state -state process is something that has been used repeatedly in the Clean Air Act. That's how all the standards are done on on smog and soot. There's nothing novel about that process. It's parallel to what's done in other parts of the Clean Air Act. States have been doing this all along. So um, this is not a new feature of Clean Air Act policy, um, and states are well aware of that. Question over here. Hi, Zach Coleman with the Washington Examiner. Um, just wondering, what is the benchmark that you all are looking for, the benchmark year, the baseline year? Because, uh, David, you were talking about, you know, you don't want to have these utilities get credited for something from maybe 10 years ago, you know, that makes it less stringent to standard, the reduction is less drastic. So what are you looking at? And if, and if it's too uh, far in the past of a benchmark, is, is there a chance that you all go to court on this? So the question of, of the baseline, where do you start from, is obviously connected to how far can you go by a half year like 2020. And so we put a proposal together. We started our work in 2011, so we picked uh, the average of the three prior years. Uh, there are others who advocate that going back to 2005. Um, I'm not hearing anybody advocating going back further than that. There's actually a very little difference between the emissions in 2005 and 2008. So we think that this is a less important issue than it appears. It's more important to uh, have an ambitious standard taken. You decide where you're going to start from, and then you have an ambitious standard to make as much reduction as you can. By 2020 and 2025, and as I've given as an example, we've shown how you can get a 35% reduction below 25, below 2005 levels. By 2020, we actually have runs that show that you can get above 40 percent. But is there is there a chance that you go to court if, if it's not stringent enough? I mean, I'm reminded of the stimulus fight where you had some people saying the administration didn't do enough for the stimulus. I mean, is there a chance that the administration can't do enough for well, climate with this rule? We don't know what EPA is going to propose next. Week. We are hopeful and confident that it will be a good, strong proposal, and they will ask for comment on uh, ranges that allow for you know, more reduction or less, or less reduction. We are going to advocate for the comment period for the strongest possible reduction. Um, I think the bigger risk of litigation is from the other side. Steve Muffin, do you have any questions? Um, I was just wondering whether, in the end, this all is a little bit like an EPA. Not that this is necessarily Problem. But doesn't this all end up looking a little bit like an EPA imposed RPS program? Where essentially well, by going, by allowing people to mix together renewables to lower their carbon intensity, that's more or less the same thing as what our, yeah, our, our view of this is. is First of all, those are good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say that not necessarily a problem from your point of view, but I've just but, yeah. you know, working, working within the Clean Air Act, as I explained earlier, the obligation needs to fall on the on the carbon emitting plant. You, you don't actually regulate somebody who doesn't emit carbon. But the question then is considering that the power system is a system and all these plants are connected and a utility uh, company president sitting there he decides hour by hour which plan am I going to dispatch from and and when he looks into his investment um, uh, uh, decisions which which things do I want to build which things do I want to retire this is the way they make these decisions they consider all the resources including increasingly does it make sense for me to invest in reducing power needs in a building like this rather than in building a new power plant to service an inefficient building. They make these decisions this way. It makes sense to structure the compliance uh, instruments, the compliance uh, uh, structure that way. So but wouldn't it be, uh, I mean, if you're in an RPS state, which already has pretty aggressive goals, wouldn't that essentially be a, be 
mean that you would have any impact on using the EPA right? Um, we think that in uh, we constructed this proposal to move from the starting point to 2020 and 2025 to make reductions over that period. We don't care uh, in this proposal whether that reduction, whether any part of that reduction would have been driven by a state policy already in place, would have been driven by uh, the, um, the pure economics, everything that changes things towards the reduced emissions counts. And uh, if you're pushing the rock down a hill, it's a lot easier than if you have to push the rock up a hill. I'd just like to Do add you know if how many states might state. not actually be affected at all as a result of that? We think almost every state has has to do something. Some of the states have planned to do it already. For example, the, the northeastern states a year or so ago strengthened their uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative target uh, very substantially. And um, depending upon what EPA does, they may be able to demonstrate that what they're doing is equivalent. Uh, that's not to denigrate what they're doing. They, they got out ahead. I would just add, if, if somebody wants to make the argument against EPA standards because it'll cause more clean energy, good luck. Um, but the other is the EPA sets the standard. <coughs> states have to figure it out. So states that already have an RPS in place or states that have efficiency standards in place are pretty well positioned to be able to meet the standard. And many states are looking forward to the opportunity to build on those assets that they've already been investing in, which is one of the reasons why we think a lot of states and there's a lot of businesses that see opportunity in these standards, opportunity to grow clean energy businesses, which put more people to work per dollar invested, and create a whole <coughs> number of additional benefits at the state level. So that's part of the reason I was asking, it just seems politically like not as heavy a lift, but in fact it's not, it's, it's affecting a more limited group of yeah, I mean, uh, your question underscores the fact that, I mean, the state-by-state -state basis does allow different approaches, different ways of doing it. I mean, and, and that um, that's one of the hallmarks of the proposal, partly because of the way the Cleaner Act is, is structured, that it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all and the kind of uh, language about imposing something on states that they can't handle the very question you're answer, asking underscore how, uh, how weak a uh, line of argument that is. One by getting, getting to the one, politics. One last point on this, and then I have The states that haven't done any of these things have opportunities that the states which have done don't have. Uh, a state which hasn't built up a renewables or an efficiency program has a, a very cheap pathway in front of it. Uh, I, uh, we, uh, we have time for a few more questions, and just a reminder tomorrow. Uh, NRDC is going to be putting out some more details of our proposal, so please stay tuned for it. You know that there's this event tomorrow. Can we just add that, that that'll include our uh, analysis of, of job creation um, as well as electric bill savings to, um, from uh, our proposal on the carbon state. Kate? Uh, environmental groups in general and the NRDC, including in some ways, have been critical of uh, gas development as it is right now in the U.S. Are there any positions on how much of this should or could be met by gas? Um, our analysis shows that if you have a proper and you have a strong emphasis on the energy efficiency opportunity, which is the lowest cost approach anyway, that what happens in the end is that gas stays about the same. It doesn't go up more than it's going to go up. And, uh, and there's a lot of steps in between, but efficiency replaces coal. Uh, it doesn't replace all coal. In our proposal by 2020, uh, there's still three quarters as much coal generation as there as there was expected to be uh, with no carbon standards. But efficiency is what makes the uh, difference, and you don't see a big run up in gas. Uh, Bill Sternberg, USA Today. From a global perspective, how much good will these standards do in the absence of similar action by the other major emitters, particularly China? Let's let Jake take that one. Jake Schmidt? Oh, sure. Um, so thanks. I'll come. The microphone so you can give me that. That's an interesting microphone. Um, so they, they matter quite a bit. The, when I, you know, meet with officials from China and India, whether it's ministers, climate negotiators, 
and I always want to talk to them about what they're doing, what steps are you doing. The first three questions I always get is what's happening in the United States uh, and more recently what's happening on the power sector. Uh, people are very closely paying attention to what, what uh, signals the U.S. sends in terms of how it's going to deal with its biggest source of, of carbon pollution that's unregulated. Everybody understands that this is a, a big deal in terms of whether or not the U.S. is going to deliver upon its international commitment and, and <clears throat> our ability to go into conversations with China and uh, encourage them to make even even deeper efforts is going to depend uh, largely on whether or not the signals uh, coming out of this uh, send that, that right uh, pathway. And so, uh, as we all know, if anybody, you, many of your outlets have already written that dynamics have changed quite a bit in China. The air pollution is the number one issue in terms of social unrest, and, and the dynamics in China are going to change uh, very quickly in the next uh, couple of, of months and years as the country grapples with this uh, you know, air pollution and so things like capping coal, things like reducing its coal consumption are very much in play in China in the next couple of years. And so uh, Chinese officials, Indian officials, I think are very closely watching uh, the developments in the power plant standard. Every country needs to know that every other big country is in the game. This is uh, the United States way to show that it's in the game. Yeah, I mean, just to underscore the same point another way. So, I mean, this is the prerequisite, we think, for the other international. So, I mean, basically to argue that you won't be able to graduate if you don't take the 400 class and ignore that you first have to take the 100 level class is not a very good question. Question, Can you talk more about the states that have the farthest to go, that have, they have, have done the least and have the, the biggest uh, carbon emissions, like Indiana? How is this going to be fair to them? You said they have some least costs, some low costs. Well, so to to uh, reemphasize that in our proposal, um, and we think EPA is in some way going to embody this, differentiate between the states. You have a different target for each state, which is which depends on where they start. So the uh, states that have historically had um, nearly all coal generation would uh, have to make an improvement, but it would be from where they start. And the um, improvement rate that they can make may well be greater, maybe faster than you could expect from, let's say, a state like California. Because, as I was saying earlier, and Indiana has not done the things that, that, that have worked in California. They have a lot of low-hanging fruit that California's already had. And uh, it, it, I'll just point you to Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky has uh, issued a, a plan. And in the background section of the plan, it notes that um, their uh, fuel mix is shifting. It was in the high 90s percent coal based uh, generation. By, the, by 2020, I think they expect, and this is without the standards, to be down uh, in the 70s. So there's a transition going on in the state like that, and a lot of it's extremely low cost. And, and, and if they invest in efficiency uh, in ways that, that some states already have, they're going to find a, a really big pot of low cost emission reductions just waiting there to be uh, scooped up. So you see that primarily through efficiency standards? Or? Well, they're shifting, they have already shifted in Kentucky, they report. Uh, the, the, the percentage of gas generation is coming up. I think, uh, I don't know if they report that wind is coming up, but there are, there are renewable opportunities all over the day, that part of the country, especially solar energy in the southeast, and, um, and the efficiency opportunities. So they have, they have lots of ways to reduce emissions. Another question right here? Uh, Tim McDonald from Mother Jones. Just one more question about the politics. Where do you expect this um, to be the biggest uh, issue in the general elections? I mean, where do you think this is going to be coming up the most? Which We're seeing it in a lot of places already. Uh, definitely Michigan has been the, the issue du jour here lately. I will note, though, just a little tidbit of information. Peters was down a month ago, um, actually about six weeks ago. And the only messaging he has used in the last month is on climate change. Now, and now his numbers are he's at five. 
Um, I don't want to pretend like that's all because of climate change. I think it's also because he got out there and he started talking to the people. But I do think that's a really interesting little tidbit, and it's going to be really interesting to watch the rest of the race. Um, I think it'll pop in Colorado. We're already seeing it pop there. They attempted to, the other side tried to frame Kay Hagan on this. They found out it wasn't actually a really good message in North Carolina, so they backed off there. Um, in fact, it hurt them, it seemed like, in, in that state. So we, maybe it could be a circumstance where we could see Kay Hagan even go on the offensive. I have no knowledge of that, though, just to be clear. We've also seen it pop in Alaska. Beckett seems to be hang, hang, hanging in there and handling it on his own um, there as well. But, um, but I think that's where you'll see it. Florida, um, you know, we don't really monitor the governor's races as closely as we do in other of the Senate races, but I do think that, you know, seeing Rick Scott, Rick Scott actually, I don't know if you guys saw this story, he, he declined to answer, and that became the news story. His climate denial was just basically like, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, and that became a major news story. And so I do think that, you know, Florida's paying attention, and so I, I believe that this will become something to, to pay attention to. Can I, can I just add to that? Sorry. So, um, so that, right now, in fact, the National Mining Association has some radio ads up in half a dozen states, which uh, NRDC on Friday um, sent a letter to radio stations asking them to take it down because it contains false and misleading inf- claims about the impact of carbon standards on electric rates. Um, and uh, we are going to fight uh, those kinds of claims and um, that, that line of attack from the NMA and the Chamber and, and NAM um, consistently, and we'll try to make sure that they can't, uh, you know, they can't air false and misleading information. Um, and I think that, you know, as Heather pointed out in the last elections, an awful lot of money was put into trying to get rid of um, environmental champions. At, at the end of the day, I think that uh, although the Chamber every Virtually every time somebody proposes cleaning up the air, the chamber, um, you know, goes into the uh, prediction of apocalypse mode. Um, and, and virtually every time, or every time, they have been proven wrong. Um, we've it's got a very good thing their members don't run their companies the way the chamber projects the future. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, the, uh, you know, we've seen it again and again. And the, uh, the, Claims like what the National Mining Association put out last week are going to be very similar to what you know people will hear from the chamber later today, and they've been proven wrong again and again and again. And we're going to hold them to a line of um, they have got to stick to the facts. But we've got more facts on our side. We have another question in the back, and I think we'll have to take one more after this one. Uh, given that the uh, probably the noisiest environmental debate in the last couple of years. <laughs> I, I just wanted to put in context uh, this issue could, uh, compared to Keystone I'm talking in two ways. So the first, whether uh, if, if these are these are regulations are successful and do what you hope they do, uh, whether that changes the political equation, the importance of the Keystone. And second of all, if we can compare the two issues by orders of magnitude in terms of emissions, how is it sort of to help the general public understand how many more times uh, these regulations, like you know, percentage wise David will start in the second issue and then I'll the first. Yeah, I just say that our view is we need to stop building new infrastructure that commits us to decades of high carbon uh, energy. And that's the fundamental uh, basis of our position on that. So then that uh, pipeline will not be named. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, what we're about here is cleaning up existing infrastructure and so much I think the the debate over the Keystone pipeline has you know helped rally uh, elements of the public on climate I think this will the standards will rally an even uh, broader amount and so that will again climate action will seem like much more of a necessity and a routine step and that will have implications for the pipeline as well obviously the timing of the two it's uncertain how they're going to interact. So. Sorry, I saw a hand right here. This will be our last question. Thank you. Well, Laura Garner from CQ. Uh, back to the, the politics of this, you, I think you were talking earlier about how you think this, the, this rule is the could be the political sea change on climate. But there's been a lot of polling that climate change ranks relatively low among voters in terms of their priorities. I think Heather, you can hit on that with the Gary Peters race, that it's not the only issue. So how, how do you envision this 
climate politics, how do you envision climate politics persisting into the future and staying at the forefront? So I think climate? a couple of things. First of all, I think it's going to move up as people, uh, as the issue gets more attention, so that that will put it more in the public mindset. <coughs> but I think, frankly, the metric of where it ranks on daily uh, issues for the public really doesn't, is not so essential. Um, what matters is, will the public support action? And that's where the polls are pretty, uh, not only consistent, but incontrovertible that the public does support action. And again, as that happens, action becomes more and more routine. The arguments against it become harder and harder to uh, defend. And so I think the, the idea that climate, climate doesn't have to rank as the most important issue uh, to have it, to have climate politics be something, climate action be acceptable, important public politics. So I think, I think frankly, the where climate ranks in terms of public awareness is mostly a red herring. Um, right. That's important. I just, but, but just really quickly, I was going to just say the rising um, American electorate here is really important for people to understand. The three groups that actually want climate action the most are women our young people, our Latinos. And those are the three groups that will win in the 2016 election, probably will be the ones who, who elect most of Congress in the 2014 election as well. And so if people want to be leaders into the future, this is an issue that they will have to take seriously, whether it's first on the list or whether it's sixth on the list. It just doesn't matter. And so I think that as we go forward, people are going to be looking for leadership on a, on a number of different issues. This will be one of them. Climate denial will not last. And, um, and I don't think that anyone's going to be able to get elected into the future if they continue this line of, of messaging. Can I just say one last thing? It partly gets back to Bill's question. So first of all, you know, the concerns about international presuppose that this is going to be a disaster if we go forward, right? And so why should we take this step if, um, if you need other countries to take action also? And so we don't accept that basic premise. We think the information Pete talked about that we'll be putting out tomorrow will show that actually there are mostly advantages to moving forward, and so it's much more why not do this anyway. The other is... And this may well, get back to the. Can, go ahead. The, the reason is because it's the right thing to do, and there is something that the U.S. can do about it. And people recognize we do have an obligation to protect future generations and to protect our health, <coughs> and they support taking action. And sometimes we do have to be the moral leader and rely on the fact that other nations will follow our leadership. But we, we have to lead in order for them to follow. This is how we can do it. Well, most, thing, most OECD countries would say that the United States is a laggard in all of this. Well, right, right. right. Not well, well, they, well, we don't think that they will say that as we get these standards. That's the point. That's, why it's, that's, that's, the that's point. why it's a prerequisite. The other thing is, I think you'll see, in terms of the politics, that the other side is trying out all sorts of arguments, which is a sign that they, that they acknowledge that this is not simple, that the, that the landscape is really not necessarily where they are. They can't decide whether they want to attack the science. That looks less and less politically uh, successful because uh, you look like some kind of throwback. So that's fallen off the charts. They're going to try all sorts of economic arguments where we think there's less and less. It's easier and easier to prove that those arguments don't carry weight. When that fails in the past, they've sometimes used the international arguments. But I think what you're seeing is they're facing a landscape where it's not clear to them, even how they win on this anymore, and I think that's why they're going to be throwing everything at the wall. I think we're prepared for all that, as is the White House, and uh, this will indeed be the pivotal fight where, uh, in the end, uh, there won't be an argument about whether to take action on climate change. The way, the, thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Tune in tomorrow. Okay.